It was super, super sweet and so funny and never took anything too seriously. He had a very unique sense of humor that I think a lot of people didn't get. He wasn't someone you got to really know immediately when you met him, which made him, you know, more of a mystery. He always had a really great heart. He had great intentions. Whether it seemed like it or not, he was always you know, trying to be helpful. He laughed at everything and everyone, including himself. He got along with everybody. He would give you the shirt off his back. I mean, he, he was one of the nicest people. I first met Ken when I moved to Jim Thorpe uh, back when I was in second grade. Uh, we quickly became really good friends. You know, he was one of the first you know, kids I started talking to. I assume I met Ken Stafford in kindergarten. Um, I remember him all the way through elementary school. He was kind of quiet as like a really little kid. He might have been the first person I've ever slept over anybody else's house, I think. And I'd go up there and, and just have a blast. We had a great time at his house. I mean, we played video games all night. He always had, you know, the coolest transformers and toys, but like, he always used to, you know, just have have more fun stuff to do than I could even imagine sometimes. You know, he he had this little rider tractor that, you know, he would ride around on this little, you know, cart that he would pull behind it with me in it. You know, we would, you know, pretend it's a train and, and do all kinds of stuff. I remember specifically one time I thought he was absolute genius. Like, basically, uh, we were getting ready for the third grade science fair and he wanted to show me his project and he basically, what he did was he took a remote control car and he had HVAC taped uh, a teddy bear to the top of it and covered the entire thing in aluminum foil and HVAC tape and it just looked like you know this little silver rolling robot and, and I knew it had no no scientific purpose at all and that there was no way that it was winning the science fair but I thought it was absolutely great and genius and probably one of the most creative things I'd seen at that point in my life. The imagination that he had you know for you know for coming up with stuff like that was just great. When you're young you don't really see you know, the kind of strong, you know, friendships you have with people, you know, but, but me and him really, we really did have a connection on a, you know, on a, on a really, you know, raw level when we were that young and, and we had a lot of fun times together. As we got older, I got to know him better and better, especially after high school. I think I got to know him even more. Uh, he was a little scary before high school because I didn't know him very well and he was just that, that big guy who hung out with Jason Tramick. <laughs> I was afraid of Kyle Petrick too, because he had really big spiky hair. I moved here to Jim Thorpe in eighth grade, and we were in the same homeroom the next year for high school, because kind of started sitting on that lunch. We had a lot of the same classes together, and you know, first it was just kind of acquaintances, and then it was friendship. By like senior year, we, we were kind of inseparable. We just hung out, we did stuff all the time together. I mean, a lot of people thought that we were we were like Beavis and Butthead, kind of, you know, we, we had all the same, you know, all those inside jokes and then we, all the same mannerisms and stuff at that point. Like. Jason, when we started having fireplace nights, he would bring Ken Stafford with him and then we all got to know him and knew that he was a great guy. It was always fun to have them hanging out at fireplace night up at Chelsea's house. They always came together, always had a great time. I think in that environment, you know, you really got to, you know, meet the real Ken. He could loosen up, relax. That's when his maniacal laugh always came out, which is something I can still hear coming from him. <laughs> always made everybody laugh. Ken and Jason, they had, you know, one of those friendships that were hard to find. You could see that they were obviously best friends. They were attached at the hip. They, you know, made the best, they were the best sidekicks to each other. They had the best jokes when they were with one another. A lot of people when they say, hey, they don't fit in or something, it just means they're not popular or not cool. I, I always felt like I just didn't belong. It was a little different than that. And, you know, with me and Ken, like, we just got each other. We were just so similar. Jason and Ken were the male version of me and Amber. They had their own little world and their own jokes and the way that they viewed things and no one was really, they would let you in a little bit, but they, no one could ever really figure that out. And that's how Amber and I still are. But they were each other's person, for sure. Whenever I saw Ken and uh, Jason together, I always admired their accumulative um, sense of humor and just how funny it was to watch them make fun of the things around them 
And this led me to say several times to both of them, I said, you guys have to have a radio show because the things that they said together were always fun and, and absolutely hilarious and just, I could listen to it for hours and be entertained. And we mess with Mosley all the time. Uh, heckling Mosley during class is always fun. <laughs> We were pretty, we didn't really get in much trouble in school. I mean, we, we, we didn't really care much for our studies or for being there all the time, but besides that... <laughs> we thought Jason and Ken eventually would announce that they were going to live together forever and that they were just going to be together. And we never would have been surprised and we would have supported it 100%. It would have been great. Not that we actually thought they were gay, just the fact that they were best friends and they were that close. <laughs> A lot of people make the mistake of calling, calling us best friends because we really didn't refer to each other that way. We referred to each other as brothers. That's really what we were, you know. That's how we treat each other. We were, we were closer to family. He started out as, you know, the big scary guy behind Jason and then worked his way into he could have been anybody's best friend. Ken always had fun. You know, it seemed it seemed like no matter what he was doing, he was having fun, and, and uh, I think he he always had he always kept a really good sense of humor. You know, he was definitely able to laugh at a lot of things that uh, you know that some people might get down about. So we were uh, having our senior night and watched some of the digital yearbook. We decided to show the pep rally video, and I knew what was in that video. It was a part in the digital yearbook where I put a censored mark over Ken Stafford's butt because his butt crack was sticking out um, while he was tackling Chad from wearing a Marion shirt. I remember at the time when I was cutting it, I was debating whether to use it or not because it could be seen as offensive. Well, while we're watching the video during that uh, senior night, Ken Stafford just happened to be sitting right behind me and I'm like, Shit. So as that part was coming up, I decided I had to face it. I had to face Ken. So I turned around and looked at Ken and I said, Ken, I am so sorry, man. I am just, that was a really despicable thing to do. And he looks at me and he goes, no, it's all right, man. It was pretty funny. And it just, just made me think at the time like I don't think I would have been capable of reacting the same way that uh, Ken did had I been in his situation I probably would have been so embarrassed and pissed about the whole thing but uh, he was really humble and he had just an awesome sense of humor Ken opened up in the end of high school he loved everybody at least in my opinion he would be friends with anyone and he started to really just shine I think as high school went on I think we both got more social I think I think we both got more comfortable in our skin a little bit more. He got to know a lot of people and got to do a whole lot of new things that he, I don't know, that he had before. And we did chess club together, uh, fireplace night over at Chelsea's, we did that. St. Patrick's Day parades, those, those are always interesting. We'd go get a pizza at Christina's, hang out, watch football or play video games. Or, and we'd just talk online. Yeah, we were kind of, um, despicable in our time. <laughs> Very much ap appreciated our female uh, peers and classmates and <laughs> the girls that actually did like us, a lot of the times they would like both of us, which was kind of weird. <laughs> they, they would like one and then start liking the other one and those were the ones that had good taste, I guess. I don't know. Sometimes you, you steer clear of it. If they had a history together, like, they just broke up or something. It's like, yeah, no, get away from me. <laughs> you have a clip of an interview with him, I think for the digital yearbook, where he called himself uh, the god of the sophomore class. I just love the fact that what, being a senior, that means you're at the top of the food chain, and I guess to all the sophomores, to you guys, I like you the most because to, to you, I'm a god. That was a classic. <laughs> And it was true. We, we really, he really was. We, we hung out with, with a lot of the, them. My favorite memory of Ken was when he came to Fireplace Night and came up on the porch where we were all hanging out and he sat down on my mom's old green rocking chair and it collapsed underneath him into a pile on the floor and he hit the ground and then we all started laughing. It was, it was hysterical. And he stood up and took a bow in true Ken fashion. It was great.
During St. Patrick's Day, Ken and Jason were always, you know, two fixtures of the parade day. I always knew, you know, coming home from college, going to the St. Patrick's Day Parade, I could find those two at Matt Purdy's house every year, year after year, and hang out with them for a while. I could definitely depend on him being there and making the parade feel more like home. When his parents ended up splitting up, and then his, his dad eventually passed away, and his, and his mom relocated, and we still had his house all to ourselves, and man, that was a party every weekend there. <laughs> I remember the first time we ever drank was on the New Year's together. It was just hilarious. We drank a bottle of Jack Daniels, we had some beers and whatever else. Him banging on his mom's door and wishing her Merry Christmas, even though it was New Year's, and walking around with his giant tag on and being drunk and trying to jump on a treadmill and just like, <laughs> and drunk dialing people. And we actually started a club because when we always drink, he, he'd always have, he'd have this hard hat sitting in his room for some reason. So anybody who came over and, and drank with us, we had to take a picture of them with the hard hat on while we were drinking. They were called the Drunken Hard Hat Club, and I still have that to this day. Yet the other one I have, we have, we actually made championship belts. Drinking championship belts. He, he was the beer champion, I was the liquor champion. We actually took them to the bar and had challengers, so that was kind of cool. <laughs> I got the phone call from uh, his brother telling me about it. He told me, you uh, know, you should really sit down for this. And they told me I didn't really believe it at first. And then I kind of broke down and then his mom called and asked me if I was okay. And I said, no, because <laughs> it's true. And we both broke down on the phone. Um, and that was, that was hard and, and it was hard too. Uh, figuring out how he passed and then having to relay that message to all his friends was rough and having to go to work and with that on my mind was rough and eventually they had his mom finally put together a little service for him and that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to do this here now is because yeah, I know when they asked if anybody wants to get up and say something and I was just kind of froze because, you know, emotions took over and I just, I'm not, I'm not really one for public speaking to begin with and so I just kind of froze and I, I felt a little bad about that because I know if, if it was the other way around that he would have been up there singing my praise, he would have ran up there to, to tell everybody about me. and. and I mean, he would have made me sound like the most noblest man, and <laughs> even though I've probably never done much to deserve it, that's just how he would have. That's how he was. Um, so I felt I felt like I owed it to him a little bit here, to kind of talk about him. I read about it on Facebook. Someone posted that Ken had died, um, and I immediately messaged Jason just to find out if he was okay. Um, And that's when you knew the crew would never be together again, because one of us would always be missing. And then I really just wanted to hug Jason, but I lived in Colorado, so I couldn't. <laughs> it felt really bad for him. I would be devastated if my person died. So when I see him at the reunion, I'm going to give him a really big hug. <laughs> I know when he passed away, you know, and so, someone told me that I was one of the lucky ones because a lot of people go their entire lives and never have like a friendship or a bond like that. And at first I was just like, well, I'm just trying to console me or whatever, but I really thought about it over time. And I'm like, this is true because there's so many times where like I see something or it's like something's funny. It's still, I still want to pick up the phone and call him and, and talk to him about stuff all the time and I can't, but. He, he always was such a great guy, you know? I mean, 
all of us, you know, and certainly me included, can can have our moments, but but Ken always seemed, you know, you know, even when he wasn't in the best of spirits, you know, he always kind of seemed like like he was sort of optimistic about it anyway. I think if Ken could choose how his legacy would be remembered, I think he would want all of us to remember him as being the big, funny, gentle guy that he was. And I think he also would want us all to get Harleys and jean jackets and cut the sleeves off of them and then ride our bikes everywhere. You know, I think Ken was one of those guys that if you were lucky enough to get to know him, um, then you were lucky enough to get to know a really, truly down-to-earth, really nice person. Um, I think he was just taken from this earth way too soon, but I know that what he's left behind hopefully reflects the great character that he had, the great sense of humor that he had, and he's, we're really gonna miss him a lot. I think he was happy. He had everything he wanted, I think. You know, he had his fiance and he just had his daughter. And that was his pride and joy. And, you know, he was working really hard and finally turned his life around for her. And, like, I, I know, like, you know, near the end of his life, he, he moved to Vegas for briefly. And he'd call me on the phone and he, he, pro he probably never had an idea a clue what was going on in my life for months because all he would talk about was his daughter and, and it just sound, you know he would have been the best you know father in the world and, and it's a shame that that was taken from him and his, his little girl and, and I, I know I always pictured us you know growing older getting beer guts getting gray hair and you know having barbecues in the backyard and watching our kids play together and but he, he would have been you know a re really good father and I think that was probably his greatest achievement was his little girl Lilith.